principle means the first, the first layer, the first things. He said the doctrine of Christ, what Christ taught, what Christ, ex his example was. He said, let's go on to completion or perfection, not laying again the foundation. You know, you can lay the foundation over and over and over and over and over again, and all you have is a foundation. And the world doesn't see anything. <laughs> Come on, how many of you know God wants to be seen? God wants his name to be known, his light to shine bright. He wants to have that exposure, and he does that through his people called the church. And, and there's so many things that are, that are, you know, the foundations are cracked and the buildings fall down, that kind of thing, and, and we don't want that anymore, amen? We need a generation that's strong, courageous, understanding. God, give me wisdom. I'll do the work, amen? That should be our cry. No, don't give me wisdom so I can have a blessing. Give me wisdom so I can go to work. So I can do something that's going to make you great. Because I can promise you, when you make him great, you don't have to worry. Your blessings are right there forthcoming. Amen? So we're studying tonight. As he said, and, and the reason that they're in a progressive order, notice how they are, the foundation of repentance from dead works. We need to understand that's a foundational thing. That's something that we never lose sight of. It's something that we always have, and that's going to be part of the message tonight. Repentance from dead works. What are dead works? Works that don't produce anything. <laughs> Have you ever seen them begin to build a building and never get finished with it? That's like dead works, man. It doesn't have any function. It's never completed. It doesn't do anything. It's just there. It, it looked like it was going to be magnificent, but it just, they ran out of money. They ran out of time. They, I don't know, whatever. But there's nothing worse than that, amen? It, it becomes an eyesore. <laughs> I wonder if the church has become an eyesore. You know, I don't know. So the foundation has to be there. Repentance from dead work. We've got to look for things that work, that God is involved with. And then once I understand repentance, then I've got faith toward God. That was our last study. For, we did that on two Wednesday nights. And then tonight, the doctrine of baptisms. Notice the baptisms is plural. Yeah. All right, we'll talk about that in a moment. So once you have repentance, now you can move in faith. And once you're moving in faith, then the baptism of, of, the, of the Holy Spirit and the baptism, one of the ones we'll talk about tonight, is now going to have an effect on those in us around, and around us. Uh, and then it says, then laying on of hands. You know, too many times all we did was make a doctrine out of laying on of hands and forgot about repentance from dead works, faith toward God, and the baptism. And so when you, when you just go to step four, then what you do is you lose the dynamic of those other ones. You don't get anything done. Come on. Well, you know, that's just the truth. And then of the resurrection of the dead. Wow. Resurrection power. God will bring things to life. Look at your neighbor and tell him God makes things live. You understand? He made you live. You know, life is not this. Life is in here. When it came alive in here, man, the world looked different. My marriage looked different. My family looked different. Uh, the, what I do looked different. It had a purpose, had vision, had things behind it. And so resurrection, God wants to resurrect things. He wants to resurrect the lost and make them come alive in Christ. And then he wants to make sure that, man, if there's something that's causing death, he says, man, look, I've got power to overcome that. Amen. And then the last one there is uh, of eternal judgment. We talked about that a little bit. But tonight, so we can get through it, we're looking at baptisms. Everybody say the doctrine of baptisms. All right, so that's if you got one of the handouts that you have, I got you a little fill in the blank, kind of helps you stay with me and focus on the blanks of those words that I want you to grab hold of. As you can see, uh, see right here, the first one, baptism, means simply submersed. All right? That's all it is. It just means to submerse. When something is baptized, it's not just, it's not a religious word. All right? It's just a word that means to be submersible or to be, submerse something into a substance. All right? And the reason that it means to be submersed into water or a substance of some kind is because water is not the only baptism. But baptism by the root of that word and what it means means to be submersed into something. All right? All right, and so for the purpose of, what are you submersing? For the purpose of purification, washing, and cleansing. Purification, washing, and cleansing. Purification, washing, and cleansing. 
So that's the purpose of baptism. All right? Purification, washing, cleansing. When you're talking about when, what, what our initial, what we're doing with water baptism. We get born again, God does something to us spiritually, then we go to water baptism. And I told you the testimony before of the, when I learned what baptism really was, and not just from a religious sense, but I understood what, what was meant by it. I got healed one night. It was amazing. I'd already been water baptized. I think I'd been water baptized twice. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. They just said, you got to be baptized. Okay, you know, <laughs> okay, wow, I, got, I went and dried off and went home. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't, I didn't know. I mean, you know, we just say, you know, you got you to gotta get baptized. Okay, let's do it. And so, but, then, but when I had something going on and the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I want you to fast and prepare yourself because I've been begging for a miracle. I had a rash. I mean, it looked like, I don't know what it was, all over my body. It was nasty looking. It was big things that kind of came up over the flesh and they would look like ringworms and they, looked, they wasn't crawling around, thank goodness, but they were <laughs> under there. I don't know what it was. They were blue and looked like a bruise and they'd been there for a while and we were, I was, I'd, I'd gone to crying and begging and pleading and speaking the word and, you know, telling the devil he's a liar and, you ever done any of that? Yeah. You know, I was just, man, I was, I was speaking to him. I'm glad nobody saw me because they'd have thought, surely they wanted me a straight jacket, but <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was doing all that, nothing worked and God said, I want you to fast for three days and then I want you to be baptized. Okay. How I many of you know when God speaks to you, it's good to obey? That's one of the baptisms, by the way, we'll talk about. But then I, I did that, and man, after I did the fasting, and first time I'd ever fasted longer than a day in my life, you know, and I found that there was a purpose in that. And then I went to Brother Ledford, Pastor Ledford then, pastor of this church. We went to bar a baptistry tank, went down there, man, and I said, I know this. When I come up out of this tank, I don't know what all's going to take place, but I know what I'm doing now. And I come up, and that thing was gone. Yeah. It was amazing. It was. Right then. I mean, a miracle that I actually saw that last one when I was drying off. I saw it disappearing. And when I called the pastor, he wasn't but 10 or 15 feet away, and he came walking over there, and it was gone by the time he got there. And he had seen it. He knew what was on there. Yeah. He didn't want to look at it anymore than I did. <laughs> it was scary looking. But anyway, purification, cleansing, washing, even, even outwardly. And then... Number two, there are no less than eight. Now, there are more, but usually they all are referencing these eight, and I have them listed there for you. Most of the ones, I only have one in the Old Testament there, but the Old Testament are type and shadow of what is going to be in the New Testament. Moses' baptism was a type and a shadow, okay, of deliverance, of going from the, from, you know, from one, from Egypt into and on the journey to the promised land, under the law, that kind of thing. And then you see you had the baptism of John, or the baptism of repentance, it's also called. Uh, by the way, in the Old Testament, there was another one in Joshua called the rock swap in chapter 4. When they came out before they crossed the Jordan, when they had brought the ark and placed it over the boundary of the, of the bank of the river, and the river drove up, uh, dried up, then they went and took... Uh, 12 stones from beneath the ark and they went and placed them on the bank and took 12 off the bank and placed them in the water or in the, under the ark. And so the rock swapped. Now that's a type and shadow we're going to see. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. That is a baptism or a type and shadow of baptism. The baptism of John, however, was a baptism of repentance. All right? Yeah. Then you had Jesus was baptized by John. All right? So Jesus is baptism by John. The baptism of suffering, baptized into Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The believer's baptism of obedience. And then the baptism of the dead. Now that's the only one that, was, that, that Paul was saying, this is wrong. Now there are religions that do this today. They baptize for their dead uncle. They baptize for their dead cousin. They baptize for the dead. The Mormon religion does that. And so... That's the one he said, this is error. There's no such thing. It doesn't work. But it is mentioned as a, as a means of us understanding that's not right. Well, some people need to read the Bible. So anyway, um, there's no less than eight. And then there's the type and the shadows in the Old Covenant. Now, so as we move through them, 
uh, the baptism, number three, the baptism of Jesus by John was to establish repentance. Obviously, that's what it was. All right? For the new covenant. How many of you understand that Jesus had not died yet, had not been resurrected, so this took place before? So because we're teaching this now, let me just say this, too. I meant to tell you this when I was starting out. You know, you don't have to know all this. <laughs> you, you really don't. This is not something that you have to know, but it is a doctrine. It's something that is foundational. If you want to learn about it, let's do it. If not, it's okay. Just, just sit through the service, and then we'll do something better for you next week. But, but what we do here is, is, is these things are not required that you have to know this. This is just theology. This is just doctrine, okay? And since it said doctrine of baptisms, I said, well, let's talk about some of them. So let's talk about John's baptism. Let's talk about those that were, that were being baptized by John into repentance, but yet it was in the Old Covenant. It was, it, it was not the New Testament style, all right? But when Jesus was baptized, something happened, all right? Can you imagine that here they are, John sees Jesus there in Bethabara. They, here's John sees Jesus coming and he says, oh, wait a minute, stop the show here. Here comes the one we've been waiting for, the one in whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to even stoop and unloose. The Lamb of God is going to take away the sin of the world. I mean, that, that would be very strange, wouldn't it? And Jesus comes up there and he comes out into the water. We go to Israel. I know Brother Charlie and I have stood out there in the water, and we'll baptize a whole group, and the water's about a good, good strong 50 degrees. You know, we were standing out there baptizing the last trip, and, and one of the brothers in the church, you know, he's one of the last ones there, and he's coming down the steps. I couldn't feel my legs anymore. I mean, they were just numb, man. And I'm sitting there in the water, and, and all of a sudden, you know, he comes down there and he goes, man, there's a beaver back there. I said, it doesn't matter, man. I'd never feel it if he bit me anyway. <laughs> he could chew my leg off. I wouldn't feel it. I mean, Brother Charlie, I'm telling the truth. It's cold stuff. And so, you know, here's John. He's been baptizing for a while, you know. And, oh, by the way, on that one, too, was whenever the guy, guy from Africa, I believe it was. <laughs> and, he, and he comes and he's hollering, hey, priest, hey, priest. Like, <laughs> look at Brother Charlie. Now, he's talking to us, man. He said, I got some for you to, one, you know, it was one. It started out with one, then it was two, then it was five, then it was however many. And they just kept coming. I said, man, we are freezing. I mean, we're, that, we're turning blue. Now, Brother Charlie, I, no, no, but Brother Charlie's standing about this deep, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that deep on me, but I'm telling you, I'm like, I know he's got to be cold. Every time they go down, they just whoosh, whoosh. Here's John baptizing in the Jordan, and Jesus comes down, and now he makes this announcement, and everything kind of puts on hold. Now, you know, those of you that were good Catholics, you know, you would go to confession, right? My mom forced me to do that. That was the most horrible thing you could ever put a child through. Had to go in there, and, and you think the Pope is sitting behind that little thing, and he slides that little door back, and you got to start talking. I made me nervous, man. Huh? Yeah, I ain't lying. I did. I lied my tail off, man. I'm going to tell you what I did. <laughs> First thing, I didn't want to say a whole lot of them prayers that they had you to do, so I figured I'd minimize it. So, you know, just add sin to sin, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right there in church. Oh, anyway, where was that? So here you are standing in the baptistry, in the, in the confessional line, and you're, you're waiting to go for your turn into the, what do they call it thing? What do they call it, huh? A confessional, okay, a confessional. That's pretty simple. <laughs> I thought it had a, some kind of real cool name or something. It was just confessional. And here comes, let's just say you were standing there and Jesus walks up and he's standing in line behind you and turn around. You're like, how you doing, man? You know, and he goes, yeah, who are you? I'm, I'm Rocky. You know, he said, I'm Jesus. You know, I'm like, what would you think? Would you think that's pretty odd? You would go, what, what are you doing here? And that's what John said. <laughs> Wait a minute, man. I need to be, it, I, you need to be doing this to me. I mean, I've been doing this waiting on you. You need to be doing this to me. I, and what did Jesus tell him? Allow it to be so now. Because I've got to fulfill all righteousness. So John's baptism represented something. 
Jesus being baptized with John, from John represented something. We see here, I have it just mentioned for you, the baptism of Jesus by John was to establish repentance for the new covenant. Now, Galatians 3.27, I'm going to have them bring it up here. And I've just got a few scriptures. Now, there's so many of them. We just, as many of you that have been baptized into Christ. Interesting. Did that strike you any kind of way? Baptized into Christ. You think that has any meaning with what was going on with John and Jesus? Jesus had no need of repentance, but he was establishing something that was going to be forever and ever and ever. Something that we could be baptized into. So Jesus goes down under the water. And he comes up, and something takes place. Many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's something about that baptism that Jesus did first. So that when we go down, we're not just giving and getting and identifying with death. We're also receiving life. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? You need to understand that I mean, it's okay to just go get baptized and come up and you've identified with the church and all that. That's great. But how about this? How about how important it is to understand what you just did? That's right. That's very important. That he made that something that was going to forevermore be a holy resurrection, identifying with his death. I remember Hans Kornstler said, I love the way he said it. He said, you know, we went down dirty and came up clean. He went down clean and came up dirty. <laughs> and he did that for us. Look at the next, next thing here, number four. It says, through, bap through this baptism of Jesus Christ was his atonement to swap places with fallen man. Do you understand that was part of the atonement? The word atonement just simply means an exchange of equivalent values. He completely identified with man and humanity. You know, people that think that everything Jesus did was as the Son of God, they need to understand baptism. <laughs> you understand? Because what he did in having no repentance of himself, he said, I'm going to repent for them and give them the opportunity now to experience the power of repentance. You understand there's power in repentance? There is power in repentance. Now, there's religion in repentance, but there's power when we understand repentance. And so what Jesus did, like I mentioned about Joshua chapter 4, the rock swap. He swapped places. It was in that moment that he completely identified himself as the second man, Adam. Now, do you think that was confusing for anybody? You think that, that triggered something of them going, you know, I'm not really sure the Messiah didn't. I mean, this is happening those that were gathered around, they must have been thinking like, I mean, you know, us theologically trained and very astute, you know, Bible scholars, right? We're all, we, we, we know more about Scripture than they probably ever forgot, than they've ever learned, rather. And so, so it wouldn't make sense until we understand what was taking place. They were swapping. Jesus, the second man, Adam, goes down and he comes up. That's the first thing that happened. Because he was sinless, he was the second Adam. Paul knew that. But when he came up, something else pretty incredible happened. How many of you know what that was? What happened? The Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit was seen in the form of a dove, and it came and it lighted upon him. All right, now, the sinless man, who is all man has the power of the Spirit. No miracles were done up to this point. Nothing happened up to this point. Right. right? But something is going on here, and Jesus comes up, and the Holy Spirit comes down and lights upon him. Now, a man. It's confusing because the Son of God, he's already the Spirit. What was God showing us? What was to come? This is all before Jesus was crucified on the cross. You understand that, right? 
He was establishing something. But then something else happened. The third thing happened. What was it? God spoke. What did he say? This is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. Now, for most of us, that probably just was a cool thing that happened. But for those that understood, and now they're hearing something, because for their generations, they would always do something really strange. When the dad would take the son of the firstborn and he would begin to teach him his business, he would begin to learn the family business. He would begin to identify. And when he was old enough and had proven himself worthy to be accountable and can manage the family business, then they would come in to make an official announcement in public. And this dad who had been seen with this son for all these years, the son is about 21 to 30 years old now, and so he comes out, Jesus is 30, he comes out and he would make a public announcement and he would tell the whole Sanhedrin, everybody there, he'd say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Now what that meant was, if he writes a check from the company, you can book it, it's good. If he tells you we'll deliver, we'll deliver. If he tells you, because he's speaking for me, I trust him completely, he has my heart, my interest, he has it all, and so this covenant was made and the father would make this announcement. What do you think they understood when this happened to them? Huh, all at the same time. Baptized, dove, this is my son. Do you think God was saying, watch what my sons will do? When they don't make a religion out of the Holy Spirit. Watch what my sons and daughters will do when they understand my relationship. When they have applied themselves, studied to show themselves approved, given themselves over completely without selling out or compromise, and they found worthy, I am going to then give them the part of the business. Are you listening? Strong in baptism. It was established right there. This was taking place. The swap. Now, Romans chapter 6, bring that one up. Verse 3, just to, just to show you a few of them. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That's the first thing we do in water baptism. That's what we are identifying. We got saved, and so we're making a public outward show, but it's not just an outward show. So Paul said, don't you understand? This is what's taking place. Next scripture. <clears throat> Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in this newness of life. That's on Sunday morning. We're teaching on that. Bring up 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just go through a couple of them. For as many, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all of the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Next verse. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have, have been all made to drink into one spirit. Next verse. For the body is not one, for the body is not one member, but many. Next verse. If the foot say that because I am not the hand, I am not the body, it is therefore, is it therefore of the body? You know what happens in the church today? You know, a church, a local church is simply part of a bigger body. And it should have vision behind it, and, and it should have the, it should have preparation time. It should have the, the meaning of what we're doing. And you know what we do in modern day church? People, they want to come in and they want to be, they want to use their gift and they don't understand the vision of that body. They don't understand whether this is the hand, the foot, the head, the, the mouth, the nose, the ear, the skin. On the, I just, you know, and it, it, it's got the body so discombobulated we don't even know. We, we wonder why we don't see the power. Can I help somebody tonight? 
We're not understanding the very thing. When we got baptized into his death, we gave up our life and we become part of his body. Now, when you're in a local church, this one or any other that has a vision of God, and it's not just religion, you have the opportunity to take on that vision. If your gift is flowing in that vision, you're going to be anointed. Because it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's a, much, it's a member of a much bigger body called the body of Christ. Amen? And then the last one I wanted to show you was Colossians chapter 2. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. Let me ask you a question. What is that verse telling you? This all happened in baptism, and I understand we don't have to know all this. But when we start learning the foundational truth, this is things that Paul was teaching to infant churches, brand new Christians. We can say it's over my head. It wasn't over their head. Yet we're the most educated on the planet, and the Bible seems to be over our head. It's simple. Now, wherein also you are risen with him through what? Come on, let's read it out loud. Through the faith. Of the operation of God. Let's do that one more time. Through. One more time. Through. So whose faith? Is it your faith? Is God doing something here? Seems to me. Pretty simple, isn't it? We miss out on these little nuggets. We put so much pressure. We, why, and why, I pray, why, why, why? When Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet the life that I live now in the, I live by the faith. Not my own faith. My faith is this much compared to what God has. God raised the dead. All he needs is me to believe it. God will heal the sick. Oh, well, but you know, he, he's got he's to get men that have been taught, educated. No, what he needs is somebody who just believes in his faith. <laughs> Jesus said, grain of mustard seed to do what? How much do I need? I just need to believe him. I'm baptized in his body. New level, new devil. <laughs> you kidding me? What's new about him? He's doing the same old stuff he's always done. Oh, well. You got the picture, right? Amen. This, this is an amazing verse. Who hath raised him from the dead? Ah, I love that. All dealing with baptism. Now, the fifth thing here, we are baptized into his sufferings. That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. See, what Paul understood is something we need to understand. Religion taught us, well, you know you got to suffer. Well, when you're baptized into something, when you go in, you were one way, you come up another way. When you go into his suffering, you see, he suffered for us. So when I'm baptized into his suffering, it means now I'm relieved from suffering. When I'm baptized into his baptism, into his sufferings, into what he went down in that water for to take on himself, how many of you saw after Jesus came up out of the water, not to mention the 30 years prior to that, but after he came up out of the water for three and a half years, when was there a new level and a new devil? When was there one he could not handle? When was there one that said, Jesus said, oh, Father, I need to fast and pray about 30 days for this one. Come on, you see how religious we have become? We don't understand the foundation of the power of baptism, the power of repentance, the power of being raised up with him, the power the church is supposed to walk in. Are you listening? I'm trying to encourage you tonight. Yeah. Baptism is a serious thing. Right. It's elementary. It's the first thing we do, but then we need to teach people what's going on. Amen? Happened for me that way, and I enjoyed it. When we're baptized into his sufferings, the fellowship of his sufferings, the word fellowship in the Greek is a word that means benefactor. How many of you know what a beneficiary is? Right? It means the one who receives the will. 
after the testator, after the one who gave the will has passed on. When Jesus gave us the will and he said, now, the fellowship of his sufferings and, come on now, the word to benefit from his suffering. Not to suffer for him, not to suffer with him. Come on, there wasn't enough room on the cross for both of us. He raised me up so that I could look and walk and talk and live victoriously in him as a part of his body. His body's never been defeated. This is baptism. All right, number six. We're getting to a close here. Water baptism combines two things. That's the blank. Combines two. It combines two things. Water baptism, when we get saved and we get water baptized, it combines two things. John's baptism and Jesus' death and resurrection and, of course, his burial. But remember what I told you at the beginning when Jesus went down in John's baptism before he had been to the cross, before he was establishing something. That when we were baptized into Christ, there's not just death in that water, there's life. Come on, somebody. It's death going down, but it's life coming up. I mean, is that simple enough? Because he himself made it so he did that for us and then the last thing the baptism of the Holy Spirit covers two things it covers prayer power in prayer tongues a tongue that the devil doesn't know come on now a tongue that you don't know your neighbor don't know Churches don't want it anymore because it causes confusion. Really? It might cause confusion when it's powerless, but when it's got power, there ain't no confusion to it. Come on now. There's something in that when those words come forth with power. But you know, you've got to have faith behind it. There is power that my mind can't conceive. You know, God does something with that. Do you know that? When I operate my faith in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I pray in my prayer language, God does something with that. You know what he did when 120 of them came out of the upper room? Y'all know this. I know you do. You're this Wednesday night crowd. You guys are pretty. What, what happened? They came out and the bystanders, what did they say? In their own language. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that what they were hearing was actually their language or was God converting it to where they heard their language? They didn't know they were speaking their language. But the ones that heard it said, they're speaking, that's my language. And the one standing right next to them said, no, that's my language. The one right next to them, no, that's my language. So God took that thing that he had baptized them with and confounded them all because they all heard their own language and it wasn't. Come on now. See, God, God does something when we have faith. Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, verse 8, and we know this verse. It's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive. Now, that word is the word dunamis. What's dunamis, Bill? Miracle power. Yeah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I know you know it because we talked about it so much. That's the word dunamis. But you shall receive miracle power. The second thing in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you get miracle power to be a witness. All right? Where's that at in the church today? When we're scared to pray in tongues in private, we'll be powerless in public. You understand what I'm saying? We shouldn't be ashamed. Well, you know what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. See, we take one scripture and we think it means the whole Bible. You know, now, we understand what he's saying. I understand what he's saying. You know, that I'm glad I pray in tongues more than you all. I do too. I wake up in the morning, man, that's one of the first things I like. I get my orange juice and I drink down my orange juice and I get myself ready for the day, man, and I like to pray. All right? I pray with my understanding and I pray in other tongues. Because I'm building up my spirit for the day. I'm getting myself ready. 
Sufficient to the day is evil thereof. I don't know what's out there today. I don't have to know. What I know is I'm in a body that's undefeated. You shall receive miracle power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Remember, it came upon him. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Now Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one place, one accord. Next verse. You could probably quote them, but let's look at them. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. You know, when Jesus came up out of the water, some of them said, what was that? The Father said, this is my beloved Son. Some said it sounded like thunder. You know, you know what a rushing wind is? You know what causes thunder? <laughs> it's when power splits the air and the air separates and comes back together, man. It's just... Whoosh. Just then, that's what makes that sound, right? A rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. It was, it was enough to where it got the attention of everybody. Yeah. You imagine being in your religion, and all of a sudden, the wake-up call comes from the Holy Ghost? <laughs> what it must have sounded like, you know, rumbling through the streets and Filled the house where they were sitting. It, it had a location it was going to. The next verse. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. Sat upon each of them. Last verse. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Came upon them. Now it indwelled them. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them a vocabulary. It's amazing, isn't it? That vocabulary is not just for prayer. It's to get ready for power. It's to get ready to go out and see the world changed by the fire of God, the power of God, the self-announcing presence of God. Praise team, come on back up. You know, we, we, we live in a time, I think it's funny, but how many of you understand that I'm going to start with Hollywood. Can I do that? You know, Hollywood has proven that they can put goosebumps on people. And people, it's amazing to me, they say, that, it was annoying. Man, you got to see that movie. <laughs> Two of them in particular. One was way back called The Leap of Faith. They said that guy was preaching in the anointing. I'm like, really? Hollywood can even make it look like it's the anointing. Hollywood can raise goosebumps on people's neck. And we don't know the difference. Are you kidding? People that have been in church a long time don't know the difference that that was just an act. They see these fireball evangelists and they duplicated what they were doing. It was an act. To make money. There was another one Hollywood did a good job of. Robert Duvall. The apostle. That dude was preaching, son. <laughs> I had people tell me, man. I'm like, really? You think so? That tells me that we don't really even understand what this baptism is all about. Now, maybe not everybody. I'm teaching you something here that I'm, I'm sure you didn't feel that way about it. And if you did, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bless your heart. But we really, we really, we think that, you know, and so what am I saying? Well, you bring that over in the church and what the church picked up on is all you got to do is learn how to preach. You can preach without this baptism. You understand what I'm saying? You can preach. You can move a crowd. You can get them all up and, and lathered up, man, and excited and rah, rah, rah. Sis, boom, bow, ain't a bit of power. Let me tell you where the power comes from. Thank you. When I begin to let the Holy Spirit come in and begin to Fill and refill. Get me ready. 
me tell you what, the baptism in water, man, we got baptized into repentance and baptized into a death and his resurrection. We come up alive. And then we can go and get that next experience. And that next experience makes a Christian walk really good. You get to see things that otherwise you could never see. Why? Because it's the work of God. And we get to sit there and be full of you. It's pretty cool. You know, what I wanted to get you to bear with me tonight was that the, the baptism, water baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can stand up on your feet. Baptism of fire. Baptism of, baptism into the anointing. Man, look, if there's one thing I, I, I desire before I walk out of my office into this building to come and worship with you, Lord, I'm reminding myself that I have been submersed into the anointing. Submersed. I'm ready. And the saddest thing is when that, immer- that submersion takes place and it doesn't go beyond right here. And sometimes it's like that. Maybe it's because we had a rough week, maybe a lot. But when we come to church, there's an opportunity to get some power. Baptism of fire. It's become religion, and that's got to change. Now, you can rip Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 right out of your Bible like some have. But thank God they were too late for me. (laughs) It's still in mine. (laughs) I still got it. I lost it one time. I lost it one time, and something in me just knew. There's just something in there that wouldn't let me, wouldn't let me go. And, and we needed that miracle in our life and our family. And I had lost it for several years. I didn't pray anymore. I was, I was just, you know, I'd done that. Been there, done that. It was cool. Okay, let's move on. But you know, when things got bad in my life, in our life, in our marriage, and our son was sick, and things were happening, and life was coming at us fast, and there was about a month left over at the end of the money, and a lot of other things that were going on, you know. And I would had all I could take. I was riding down Pettit Road, right there in Baker, coming from my house. We lived back off of Sandra Drive, and I got on Groom Road, and I come to Plank Road, and I crossed over. I'm going down that little road called Pettit, and I'm getting around close to the end of it one morning on my way to work, working for my father-in-law, Mr. Marshall. And going over there, and I said, God, I know what's missing. And I know that I'm not worthy for you to do this again. But if you'll give me the opportunity to experience that baptism again, I won't be childish this time. I won't let it go this time. That was back along about 1989. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, I ain't about to let it go. Yeah. Right down there on Pettit Road, I pulled over on the side of the road, and something from heaven, I, I'm not going to say it was a sound, I don't know what it was, I just know something was different in that car. And something called, came up on the inside of me, Brother Lamont, and just began to flow out. Just began to flow out. It was amazing to me. Somehow I knew that in that was going to be the answer that I was looking for. It didn't come immediately because I had some things to learn, and I still do, but it came. And boy, when it did, heaven opened up. Amen? You know, and, and it just seems like the more it opens up, the more I want more of that. 